man's victories over the many mooded sea loom large in history. One of the most memorable of those victories is the newest. It is a tie that binds the old world to the new closer than ever before. The undersea telephone cable project linking the United States to the continent. The project was planned to provide 36 or more interference-free telephone circuits direct to Europe. Conversations would travel between New York and Sydney mines in Nova Scotia by radio relay. Across Cabot Strait and Newfoundland by a single two-way cable. And from Clarenville, Newfoundland by twin deep sea cables, one carrying voices in each direction, to Penmark on the coast of France. From Penmark, land cables would run by alternate routes to Paris and on to Frankfurt in West Germany. Also from Paris, special circuits would fan out to make direct connection from the cable with Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Italy. Representing a truly international cooperative effort, the cable project grew out of a contract of agreement for joint ownership and operation. In Paris, it was signed on behalf of the French government at the French Ministry of Posts, Telegraphs and Telephones. In Bonn, it was signed for the Federal Republic of Germany at the Ministry for Posts and Telecommunications. And in the United States, the signatories were the American Telephone and Telegraph Company and its subsidiary, the Eastern Telephone and Telegraph Company, which is responsible for the facilities which pass through Canada. Before the actual laying of the deep sea cable began, there was work to be done on both sides of the Atlantic. In Newfoundland, there was the rugged task of trenching heavy land cable over the rough terrain. Dragging cable ends up northern beaches called for dauntless battles against the wind and cold. In the shore station at Clarenville, the needed installations were made to handle the volume of calls the cable to the continent would carry. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, preparations had also been going forward. The area of France, which includes the town of Penmark, is among the most interesting in all of France. The traditional dress of the area is as picturesque as it is colorful. And what better time for the members of the older generation or the younger to look their best than on a Palm Sunday such as this, whether for a gathering after church or for a stroll along the quay. It was here at Penmark that the French built the eastern terminal for the cable and the technical personnel from the French ministry worked with men from AT&T at the problems of installation and pre-testing of the terminal equipment. One proud local citizen points out the cable's route from shore to sea. And another demonstrates just where the actual cable ends have been laid down along the beach and on westward across the bay toward the Atlantic. Out from Penmark, the French cable ship Ampere laid the eastern shore ends of the cable out to a point in the Atlantic from which the deep sea lay would later begin. Since nearly 5,000 miles of cable were to be laid in a single summer, arrangements were made for the facilities of four different cable plants in four different countries to cooperate on the project. At Calais in France, the work was done at the plant of Le Cable de Lyon. Here, French workmen, long experienced in cable manufacture of every kind, lent their know-how to production of hundreds of miles of cable for the project. In West Germany, in the town of Nordenham, the plant of Norddeutsche Seekabelwerke produced additional hundreds of miles of the cable, every foot of it a further tribute to the manufacturing prowess for which German craftsmen have long been noted. At 
Erith near London on the River Thames, the factory of Submarine Cables Limited was responsible for another large portion of the total that was required. And in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the United States, work was done on both cable production and the armoring of the undersea repeaters for the project. Here was a dramatic example of international cooperation at work. For whether it was a French worker at the Calais factory who checked the thickness of the polyethylene covering around the cable core, or the American in Portsmouth. Whether British workers at Erith operated the huge cabling machines, or West Germans at Nordenham, the basic specifications were the same, and the finished product identical by the most exacting of standards. Wherever the cable itself was made, a flexible repeater had to be spliced in every 38 miles. It is these amplifiers which make it possible for the single cable to carry at least 36 conversations at the same time. Western Electric's plant at Hillside, New Jersey produced the 114 repeaters which this cable system would require. Virtual miracles of research and development, each of the repeaters contains three powerful vacuum tubes and some 60 other complicated electrical components, engineered into a series of plastic tubes, so sealed and armored that the repeater, in effect, becomes part of the cable itself. Early March of 59 saw the first of those repeaters being paid out from the cable ship Monarch as the deep water operations got underway. Even the largest cable ship afloat could not carry enough cable to cross the Atlantic in one run, the engineers of the Long Lines Department of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, who were in charge of the project, had to work out a pattern for operation as precise and as complicated as a square dance. Her first full load of cable was to carry the Monarch to mid-Atlantic. There she was to buoy off the end, return to Erith and Nordenham for more cable, Go back, pick up the cable end, and finish the westward run. A trip to Portsmouth to reload, back to Clarenville, and the Monarch would lay the return cable out to a mid-Atlantic rendezvous with the ocean layer, which had come out from Calais to meet her. The ocean layer would then splice her cable on, continue laying eastward for 900 miles, buoy off, return to Europe for a final load of cable, go back to pick up again, and lay the last leg of cable onto Penmark. That was the original plan. But before the summer was over, the planners were to remember the words of Bobby Burns, the best laid plans of mice and men gang off a glade. Yes, and the best laid cables too. The beginning couldn't have been more promising. Exactly on schedule, the Monarch completed her first run and buoyed off the cable end. Ten days later, she was at Nordenham, loading German-made cable to be joined with the British-made cable already at the bottom of the sea. The loading completed, the monarch said farewell to Nordenham and sailed down the river Vaser, back toward the open sea. Mid-June found the immediate task of finishing the east-west run proceeding perfectly. On westward from mid-Atlantic, the cable moving out steadily at six knots. On course, on schedule, and all's well. And then, icebergs. Whole fields of ice down from the Arctic. The biggest invasion in years of the white deceivers all cable men respect and fear. A single moving berg itself can cut a cable as it would a thread of silk. For the monarch, the first change in that carefully made plan. To allow time for the ice to disperse and clear the way, 
it was decided to cut cable and buoy off there. The Monarch then sailed direct to Portsmouth to reload, then to Clarenville to start the eastward run, out to the point opposite where the western run had stopped. Buoying there, she picked up the western run again, completing it to Clarenville, then returned, picked up the west-east run once more, and on to her mid-Atlantic rendezvous with the ocean layer. So it was that mid-June found the ocean layer, having taken over the task from the monarch, heading eastward virtually on schedule on the next to last of the cable runs. Once again, all seemed going supremely well. The distant coast of France and Journey's End was becoming less distant hour by hour. Of the 917 miles of this run, all but 33 had been paid out by June 15th. And then, Fire at sea. Officers, crew, telephone personnel, all ordered to abandon ship, all picked up safely by a West German vessel, the Flavia. Nearly two weeks later, under tow, the burned out shell of the ocean layer was to enter Falmouth Harbor, a far different ending to her voyage than had been expected. Again, it meant a change in the plan of the cable project. The Monarch's schedule was quickly rearranged. She it was who went to take aboard the final load of cable. Returning to the carefully charted spot in the Atlantic where the ocean layer had cut the cable free in her hour of peril, the Monarch grappled for it on the ocean floor and luckily brought it up on the first try. Splicing on, the Monarch sailed on to complete the deep sea portion of the submarine cable to France within but a few days of the originally scheduled date. So it was, the job was done. A job of many hands at many tasks. And now other hands take over. The hands of the operators on overseas switchboards in France, West Germany, and the United States, who will handle the millions of calls which the new cable will flash to those boards through ocean depths at speed of light. Those calls should do much to bring many nations closer together, both politically and economically, and contribute significantly to the defense needs of the free world. Or though the calls through the cable will be from many nations in many tongues, the cable itself speaks a single language to all. That is the language of friendship and cooperation between the men and women of France, West Germany, England, and the United States who conceived and brought to completion the cable to the continent. Man's newest memorable victory over distance and the sea. Thank you.